Good morning. It is good to be here with you this morning. I bring you greetings from Washington, D.C. We're trying to keep them at bay so that you can continue to preach and teach the good news of the gospel without freedom, with, or with freedom, without coercion, and without fear. And what a great text we have for today on this Father's Day. Um, I'll read it again from 2 Corinthians. It is written, I believed, therefore I've spoken. With that same spirit of faith, we also believe and we therefore speak because we know the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. And I, as I said, I bring you greetings. First of all, thank you, Pastor Blonsky, for inviting me to be here again with you. What a wonderful meal we had with so many last night. But in the middle of all the stuff that you see on television, in the middle of all the things that are going on, I bring you good news. And the good news is God is at work. God has always had work to preserve this world, sinful as it is, and also to save it. And that's why you gather, because you know that message. And you bring that message to the very world in which we live. Uh, you know, again, there's so many things we could have preached this morning, that, that gospel lesson. And I just thought about where Jesus says, you know, we're going to go to the other side. There's going to be a storm, and that storm's going to hit in the middle of the journey, but we will go to the other side. Another great message. Our God is always at work to preserve and to save. And that's why I love this text, because when I read this text, it basically is telling me that we can live our Christian life in full view of what is going on in this world. In fact, when the world gets even more dark, the light of Christ in and above with his people shines even more brightly. So this is one of those kinds of texts you can live the Christian life even in spite of yourself, even in the face of whatever challenges you're facing today because Christ is your love, like we just sang. And Christ is your life. And Christ will not let his people down. So we get to live this life no matter what the times in which we live. And the times, they are very interesting right now. I, I, this is a bit of a joke, but it kind of reminded me of the times we're in. Uh, a, a woman, was, she was a teacher. She was trying to actually get her kids to really understand geography. So she started to, she thought she'd have like a competition. So she said, kids, I'm going to ask you some questions. And whoever gets the answers right, you know, it will be some special gifts for you or some special privileges for you today. And so she said, first question, she said, uh, which state has the most cows? And the kids were trying to remember their geography lesson. One boy raises his hand, Texas, you're right. You're going to get that special gift. And then she said, how about this one? Which state has the most sheep? And one of the little girls was thinking really hard. And she just blurted out, Montana, you're right. And then finally she said, which state has the most turkeys? And nobody could understand. They were just, what state, what state, what state? And finally, one little boy said, Washington, D.C. You're right! <laughs> no, I only say that just as a joke because, you know, we're in a time right now where wouldn't you like to see leaders of virtue? Wouldn't you like to see leaders of commitment and conviction for the things that really are true, that really matter? That's why I think this text is so great for Father's Day because, fathers, we need you now more than ever. We need men of conviction, men of confession, men who will stick by their families, men who will stick by their church, men who will defend, men who will do those kinds of things. We need leaders like that. Where are they today? Amidst the issues of global despair, loss of hope, the never-ending wave of bad news in the middle of COVID, all those things, they seem to be leading us always down the wrong path. What's always amazing is we live in a time today where we've, had, we've got challenges, and, and of course every time has its challenges, but what is amazing to me is it's, it seems that we're willing to settle for less and less and less of what God says, and we're even more confident that we don't need Him. You know, Google, I'm not anti-Google, <laughs> but Google has this thing and I think it's a secret thing. I don't think they've talked much about it, but it's called the Google X Initiative. And I think it's still going on. And that's Google saying, we're gonna get our best and our brightest 
And we're going to take, we're going to do, come up with some radical technology and apply it radically to the problems of the world because then we're going to come up with Google X radical solutions. Do you think Google can really solve the problems of the human heart? You see, there's already a radical solution. The God who created the heavens and the earth, instead of letting it all devolve into nothingness, sent his son. Radical. He left his heaven. Radical. He became born of a virgin. Radical. He became born in a manger. Radical. He lived our life. He died our death. And he gives us his eternal life as a gift. Radical. And then even more radically, he actually chooses people like us. People who are just as broken, just as sinful, just as in need as everybody else. And he chooses us, gathers us, and says, you're mine. Now go tell everybody about who I am for you and for them. Radical indeed. There's already a solution. And that's the whole point. This text, if we take it seriously, it's never been about us. It's not about who we are. It's about who this God is. I had somebody say, you know, with technology, they were talking about, you know, it can save us, it can solve all of our problems. And someone said, man, do you know what Mussolini, Stalin, and Mao could have done with Facebook? I think that I'm scared more about what sinful people can do with the technology, not about what, you know, the best of our abilities. No, this has never been about us. You know, we're living in times of a cancel culture, deplatforming, people controlling ideas, punishing people for thinking freely, and especially punishing people for thinking about the God who gives them freedom that the world cannot take away. I just saw that the IRS canceled this one uh, Christian uh, 501c3, and you know why? Because they said that their principles aligned too much with one party or not. That's their qualification now, whether you get to be a public entity. I'm a little bit worried about my 501c3 status. Because we talk about these principles. I don't care if it rely, if the Democratic Party puts it on their platform, we'll stand with them. If the Republican Party puts it on their platform, we'll stand with them. We stand with God first. And the world will never be able to take that away. So the only thing, if we're talking about us today, the only thing we can talk about is our need. But this text not, talks about not just our need, but God's ample provision for our need over and over again, even unto eternity. If we believe in God, then we must speak of him. We must act in obedience to him. We get to serve others in his name and watch what he can do with them. Nothing else and surely nothing less. So just a few ideas this morning, just a few things to think about. The first one is this. Faith says it's time to speak. Faith says it's time to speak. So faith alone is what motivates us. Faith in the God of heaven and earth. Faith in the God who sent his son. Faith alone motivates, not some personal success story of some self-help guru. That's not who motivates us. And not the bodacious promises of modern political nobodies. We do not put our faith in politicians. Not even in the piety of the very people gathered here. And, you know, even as a church, even as we strive to do what God wants us to do, that's not what motivates us. What motivates us is faith in Christ and all that he is and all that he has done for us. Faith in him changes everything. It makes whatever I face today something I know I can face. It makes whatever successes I have today something I can celebrate. It, whatever God gives me, whatever gifts I have, it, he gives me provision so I have something to share, something to give so that we can love one another as God in Christ loves you. That's why you come to church. You want to be resourced. You want your faith to be resourced in him. You know, I, I know that... I asked this a lot of times. I said, aren't you glad that Christmas comes every year? I can't wait for it. <laughs> My daughter said, Dad, it's about time you take the tree down. <laughs> I did. <laughs> aren't you amazed that at Advent and Lent, where when the world is celebrating one way, you're getting ready for another thing? Aren't you glad about finally seeing that this God who came in Christ actually came for a reason? He came for you. And then aren't you scared to death when he's hanging on a cross? 
And then aren't you overjoyed and overawed when he is risen indeed? Revel in that. Let that be the thing that resources you. The church, you and me, we can't do anything for Jesus. We can't do anything for ourselves. We can't do anything for the community. We can't do anything unless we are overawed by our Savior. Faith says it's time to speak. But faith says about this time, it says it's time to what? To speak. It's time to say something. It's time to act. It's time to be his people so that we can be useful in his hands. It's time to continue to have that conversation with that person that you've been conversing about. Keep the conversation going. It's time to engage our neighbor as a blessing, to engage them the way God wants us to do. It's time to push back on some of the issues that are plaguing our community and say, no more of this, because we actually love our neighbors. We're not just trying to protect ourselves by being faithful to God. We're actually trying to actually bless even those um, who might be our enemies politically. We want to be that non-anxious presence in the middle of the chaos who says, no, we have something to speak. It's not what we're saying, it's what he says. It's what he has done, and it's what he wants us to share with you. See, he's the one who comes all the way in the middle of our pains, in the middle of our loneliness, in the middle of our struggles. He comes all the way to bless. And that same Lord who came all the way 2,000 years ago and went all the way to the cross when you didn't deserve it and came all the way through death so you could have his life, that same Lord still comes all the way to you today through words and water and bread and wine so you know he did it just for you. That's why I love the sacrament. That's why I love the Lutheran Church especially because when you come to this sacrament, you're not doing anything for Jesus. Jesus is coming all the way for you. And so you can go out into the world in which you are living knowing that Christ is with you and he won't let you down. Take and eat. The Lord is good. So we want to speak about this Jesus. There's nobody like him. But faith in Jesus Christ... It's about speaking and it's about acting so that people know this Jesus for themselves. You know, one of the things that I'm beginning to realize is that my work in Washington basically is to fight for your liberties, your temporal liberties. And let's say I do my job really, 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 really well. We've had some good successes. But if I do my job really well, it's not enough. Because the only thing I'm doing in D.C. is to keep your church free. To keep the public space open to you so that what? So that you can speak and act in the name of Jesus for others. Just to have religious liberty is not enough if we don't practice it, if we don't share our faith, if we don't worship freely, if we don't speak freely the things of God. Just be yourself in Christ for others and see what God can do. Speak about him. Let every boast in his name. And then act. Be obedient to him. Follow him. Trust him. When he says, go, go. When he says, stay, stay. When he talks about who God is and what God has done. When he talks about the God who orders the world. Trust him. Proclaim him. Like I said, dads, this is your day. You know, it's funny to me. When I was a pastor, I always felt badly for dads because Mother's Day, everybody knew what Mother's Day was about. Oh my gosh, we can't survive the world without our moms. But Father's Day, I don't know if that our world appreciates fathers much anymore. We, we as a church have to rectify that because dads and moms, but dads, you are vital more than ever. As I said before, it's time to speak and act. And one of the main things you you are as fathers is you're the spiritual leaders of your house. You're the first person who's supposed to speak this to your kids. You're supposed to speak this to your wife. You're supposed to be the ones that bring the family to church. Because here's the statistics. If dad comes to church, the whole family comes to church. That's, That's the data. If dads stick in the home, that home is blessed. That's the data. That's the sociological, psychological data. Now, we know it's biblically true. But you tell, if, if, if dads are in the home, and I, those dads today who are doing this, God bless you, we need you now more than ever. We need people in their vocations to speak and to act 
the way that Jesus calls us to, and then watch Jesus bless you, bless those you love, and even bless those all around. It's time to speak, and that speaking is more than just words. It's time to act. Therefore, it is written, I believed. Therefore, I have spoken with that same spirit of faith. I also believe and speak. And finally, faith says about this speaking, it's time. It's time. You know, you were made for a time just like this. I think sometimes the church is uh, too fearful. COVID was a big challenge to us. We had to figure out how to speak, even when our governors were telling us, you don't have the right to even gather. We can't let them muzzle. We can't let them muzzle the word of God. And what I mean by that, I don't mean that we should have protested and come to church in spite of, I mean, but I mean in freedom, you should have made the decisions as to how to serve your neighbors. In freedom, you should have made the decisions how to worship God, because God is the one who can solve our problems. In fact, my biggest issue during COVID was defending the church as a, as a primary institution in the country. They were trying to tell us that the church is non-essential. Can you imagine? The First Amendment says the church is the most important uh, entity in the culture. For wherever there is religious liberty, freedom for everyone follows. That's why they said there is freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and freedom of religious assembly. Because they want you not only to be able to have religious liberty, they want you to be able to act on it. Because people who are motivated by God actually seem to love others too. That's what the Founding Fathers actually said. And during this COVID, we were told by governors, we were told by even some politicians, well, the church is not that important. You need doctors, you need nurses, but you don't need pastors? Baloney. I said it this way. I said, if my father got COVID, he didn't, by the way, but if my father got it, and he was one of those first people they put in the hospital and put on the ventilator, the last word of that I didn't want my father to hear was some secular doctor saying, turn the machine off, we can't do anything else for it. Now if that doctor can go in there with a mask on, and the nurse can go in there with gloves and a mask on, pastors can go in there, or Christian brothers and sisters can go in there and say, no, 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 we have one more word to say. We're going to say Jesus loves you and Jesus has you. Take and eat if we can even give him the, the, the communion because Jesus is going to hold on to you right through death, dad, right through death, mom, right through death. And that's the last word I want to hear before I see Jesus face to face. Do you understand what I'm talking about? You're an essential organization. You're an essential voice. Don't ever let anyone classify you otherwise. Now that doesn't mean we had a... If you didn't worship or if you didn't went online for a while, in Christian freedom you make those choices, but as an essential organization. And that's exactly what Jesus says. So he wants you to speak. He wants you to act because now is the time. When you speak God's word, when you speak of God's moral ordering of the world, when you speak of God's Ten Commandments, and when you speak of God's grace, you actually offset some of the decay of this world. It can get much worse. But that's not our primary role, but that is a role. We've got to be about the cultural issues of the day. But ultimately, we speak God's good news of the gospel that calls us to life now and forever. Speak this kind of word. When Jesus says, because I live, you will live also. Speak that word. When Jesus says, if I live in you, you can do all things. Speak that word. Speak the word of God that says he is with you always. We will get to the other side. That whatever problem you're facing, you will get through it. Your life, even though it appears temporary, it is eternal. And your successes and your efforts, they're never in vain in Christ. So it is written. It's time to speak. And we're motivated by faith to do just that. Can you imagine what God can do in the lives of people like that? Can you imagine what God can do through the lives of people like that? I can. They're sitting right here. We call it St. Matthews. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, God richly bless you.